Hi folks, I'm Adam, your instructor. Welcome to the Laney College Machine Shop. Today, we're going to be working on the Finder Scope project for Machine Tech 210, the introductory course in machining and manufacturing. Specifically, we're going to be working on the intermediate piece of the adjustable altitude azimuth mount. We're going to take this 3 8 of an inch by 1 and a quarter inch by 3 and an eighth of an inch aluminum block and turn it into this part, doing all the millwork. Before we get started on the machine, let's just take a few moments to review the features on the three-dimensional solid model and the specifications on the drawing. The three-dimensional solid model shows that this part is quite a bit more complex than the last mill part we did. There are features on almost every surface of the part, and quite a few of them too. So FYI, machining this part will require multiple setups and careful planning in terms of order of operations. Anyway, let's try to break it down a bit. The part is more or less a rectangular prism with a skinnier protrusion on one side, which has a radius end. The protrusion has a couple of holes in it, a threaded hole and a counterboard hole. The main rectangular region also has a big hole going through its center. This will fit around a ball bearing that will be the pivot for the azimuth or left and right adjustment of the mount. If you look carefully, you'll see that there's a slit going through one side of the big hole, and going through the slit, perpendicular to it, is a little hole with a counterbore. This hole and the slit will be used together with a screw to collapse the big hole and clamp around the ball bearing. Finally, there are four threaded holes for the screws which will fasten to one side of the flexure that will be the pivot for the altitude or up and down adjustment of the mount. All right, here's the drawing. Before we jump into the views, let's get a lay of the land. Down in the title block at the bottom right, we can see that the title of the part is Mount Intermediate. Next to that on the left, we can see that the material is going to be 6061 T6 aluminum alloy, and the finish is going to be fine bead blast. Further to the left, you can see the tolerance block, which specifies our standard shop tolerances for the different dimensions on the print where no other tolerance is specified. These are all based on significant digits, so the number of places after the decimal point determines the tolerance of that dimension. We'll also be looking for a standard 125 micro inch finish on all of the surfaces, and we're going to interpret everything on this print according to ASME Y14.5-2018, the most recent standard for print specifications. Okay, looking at the views themselves, we can see that a nice little isometric view of the part has been provided for our reference. I think it's especially helpful on a part like this that has a lot going on. We are given three orthographic projection views, what I would call a front view, a bottom view, and a left side view. There are a bunch of dimensions which specify the sizes of various square-sided features and the locations of the holes. There are also some special hole notations which specify the sizes, depths, etc. of the features on those holes. Just as on the mount lower part, there's a leader line with a note pointing at two rectangular regions on the bottom surface of the part, which are outlined with chain lines. According to note number three in the general notes, these regions will be lapped flat after bead blasting, and then we'll apply some PTFE tape. Since we're covering the lapping and taping procedures in a separate video, I'm going to remove the related information to unclutter the drawing a bit. Let's try to get a sense of the overall dimensions of this part so we know what we're dealing with. It looks like the overall depth of the part is 1 inch 250 thousandths, or an inch and a quarter, and the overall height of the part is 380 thousandths, which is 3 eighths of an inch, 375 thousandths, rounded up to two decimal places. As before, both of these are stock dimensions, provided for reference only. The raw material we'll use for this part is 3 eighths of an inch by one and a quarter inch extruded aluminum, 
and the drawing is telling us we're going to leave these dimensions alone. However, we will need to finish the width dimension because this is what we'll cut off on the bandsaw. That overall width will be 3 inches. Notice that this dimension is not in parentheses or labeled stock because we will need to machine it. Hopefully this gives you a sense of the size of the part you should be imagining in your head. Okay, looking at the dimensions a little closer now, we can see that the main rectangular region on the left side of the part has a width of 1 inch 500 thousandths. The width of the protrusion on the right side of the part is not directly given, but since we know the overall width of the part is 3 inches, and the width of the rectangular region is 1 inch 500 thousandths, then the width of the protrusion must be 3 inches minus 1 inch 500 thousandths, which is equal to 1 inch 500 thousandths. The depth of the protrusion is 375 thousandths, and it appears, according to the center line on the drawing, that the protrusion is centered on the part in the depth dimension. So the depth of the step on one side of the protrusion and the depth of the step on the other side should be the same. The end of the protrusion is rounded with a semicircular radius of 190 thousandths, which is half of the 375 thousandths depth dimension, 187 thousandths and 5 ten thousandths, rounded up to two decimal places. The protrusion has two holes, a threaded hole and a counterboard hole going through the bottom surface of the part. The threaded hole is located 2 inches, 810 thousandths from the left side, and is on center of the part in the 1 inch, 250 thousandths depth direction. This hole will have a diameter of 201 thousandths and go all the way through the part, and it will also have quarter 20 UNC 2B screw threads. The counterboard hole is located 2 inches, 380 thousandths from the left side, and is also on center of the part in the 1 inch, 250 thousandths depth direction. This hole will have a diameter of 188 thousandths and go all the way through the part, and it will also have a counterbore with a diameter of 320 thousandths and a depth of 130 thousandths. The big hole in the rectangular region of the part is located 750 thousandths from the left side and once again is on center of the part in the 1 inch 250 thousandths depth direction. It will have a diameter of 750 thousandths to 752 thousandths and go all the way through the part. The slit, which cuts through the big hole, has a depth of 63 thousandths, which is 1 16th of an inch, 62 thousandths and 5 ten thousandths, rounded up to three decimal places. It also appears that one side of the slit is coplanar with the side of the protrusion on the front of the part. There's a hole perpendicular to the slit, which goes through the slit, that is shown with hidden lines in the bottom view and is specified with a leader line in the front view. It will have a diameter of 107 thousandths with a depth of 810 thousandths. Then it will have number 632 UNC 2B screw threads with a depth of 700 thousandths min or minimum, meaning that the depth of the threads can be more than but not less than that value. Then the hole will have a diameter of 150 thousandths with a depth of 370 thousandths, and finally it will have a counterbore with a diameter of 240 thousandths and a depth of 140 thousandths. That <laughs> is a complex little hole. Oh, and it's located 1 inch 270 thousandths from the left side and is on center of the part in the 380 thousandths height dimension. I think the final features we need to discuss are the four holes shown in the left side view. These will have a diameter of 107 thousandths with a depth of 400 thousandths. They will also have number 632 UNC 2B screw threads with a depth of 300 thousandths minimum. The holes are located 281 thousandths relative to each other, and the row of holes, the entire hole pattern appears to be centered on the part in the depth and height dimensions. Okay, that's it for the print. This one's gonna be a doozy, folks. Lots of stuff going on, but, you know, we'll knock it out one step at a time. Anyway, I think we're ready to start making some chips, so let's head out to the shop. The first step is to cut our stock. 
So go ahead and take a combination square and set it to 3 and an eighth of an inch. Then use that to set the stick out of the stock material in the bandsaw. Tighten it, double check it, and then we'll cut all the way through. Remember that this is the 3 eighths of an inch by 1 and a quarter of an inch aluminum rectangular bar, and it's the same 6061T6 alloy we've used a couple times now. Make sure to file off the burrs on the edges of the part and the stock material. Let's gather up some tools. It's going to be a long list, by the way. We'll need a half-inch high-speed steel end mill, a 5 sixteenths of an inch high-speed steel end mill, a number 4 high-speed steel center drill, a number 36 high-speed steel twist drill, which has a diameter of 107 thousandths, a number 25 high-speed steel twist drill, which has a diameter of 150 thousandths, a 3 sixteenths of an inch high-speed steel twist drill, a number 7 high-speed steel twist drill, which has a diameter of 201 thousandths, a 47 sixty-fourths high-speed steel twist drill, a half-inch high-speed steel countersink with an included angle of 90 degrees, a high-speed steel counterbore for a number 6 screw, a number 632 tap with spiral flutes, a quarter 20 tap with straight flutes, a three-quarter of an inch reamer, and a one-sixteenth of an inch wide slitting saw. Did you get all that? <laughs> All right, onto the milling machine. And I've already got a vise set up, so I'll clean off the jaws, and then we'll grab some parallels and clean those off as well. Let's mount our stock material with about a half of an inch of stick out. All right, and we're ready for the half inch high speed steel end mill, which we'll install in a half inch collet. As we did before, we'll bring the knee up so that the part is just below the cutting tool. Then we'll bring the quill down so that the part is sort of halfway up the cutting edges, the cutting flutes on the tool. We do want to minimize the stick out of the quill so that we don't run into chatter or vibration issues. Turn the spindle on, touch off the tool on the side of the part, then zero the x-axis on the DRO, and we'll go in maybe 10 thousandths of an inch for a cleanup cut. Hit the surface with a little WD-40, and then we'll take that cut, feeding along the y-axis. Okay, clean up those chips, take the part out, file off all those edges, wipe off the part, wipe off the jaws and the parallels, flip the part around, and then remount it in the vise with that same approximately half inch stick out. Turn on the spindle, touch the tool off on the side of the part, zero the x-axis, back the tool off, dial in a cut of approximately ten thousandths of an inch, and then clean up this side as well. Now I just run the tool back across the surface because I don't want to move the table in the x direction. Now let's measure the length of the part right now with a dial caliper. This looks like it's three inches and eighty-seven thousandths. Now on the digital readout, hit the set button, then the x-axis button, and type in 3.087, enter. So from here I'm going to move into 3 inches and 40 thousandths to take a roughing cut, and take that first cut. Now for a finishing cut, I'm going to dial in the x-axis to 3 inches and 10 thousandths. So I am leaving an extra 10 thousandths on the 3 inch overall width dimension. This is because we'll be using a belt sander to make a radius on one side of the part, and I like to leave a little extra material when I do those kinds of hand finishing operations, just to make sure everything cleans up nicely. Okay, we'll take that cut, and then let's measure the part with a dial caliper just to make sure that we nailed our final size. Three inches and ten thousandths on the money. Looks really good. So take out the part, file the edges, and then wipe the part off. Now that we've cut our stock material to the correct overall dimensions, before we continue on with any machining operations, we'll do some layout, meaning we're going to basically draw some geometry directly onto the part to help guide us in future steps of the process. Grab a bottle of layout fluid. I like this blue stuff. Shake it to mix it all up, then remove the top, which has a brush on the inside of it, and then we'll basically paint this stuff onto half of one of the uh, inch and a quarter by three inch surfaces. Then we're going to let it dry completely. 
And yes, we are literally watching paint dry right now. <laughs> okay, grab your part and let's head over to the surface plate. This giant hunk of granite has a top surface which is extremely flat, and that gives it many, many uses. It's arguably the most important precision measuring device in the entire machine shop, so it must be taken care of. First, we'll spray it down with some of this special surface plate cleaner, and we'll wipe it off with these lint-free wipes. And make sure it's nice and dry. Okay, we'll need some special tools. The first is this height gauge, and I kind of like this uh, digital one. And we'll also need a precision right angle plate, which has two very flat and perpendicular surfaces. Hopefully you notice that I'm making sure that there's no dust or debris between any of these surfaces. Okay, then put your part down on the surface plate and against the right angle plate so that the surface with the layout fluid is exposed because we're gonna be marking on it. And we'll be marking on it using the scriber attachment on the height gauge. You can kind of think of a height gauge as a caliper, a digital caliper in this case, but uh, there are dial versions as well, where the movable jaw is the scriber and the fixed jaw is the surface plate itself. So we can set a vertical distance of the scriber from the surface plate and use that to mark very, very accurate lines on the part. Go ahead and turn the digital readout on, then grab a two thousandths of an inch thick shim or feeler gauge. Stick this between the surface plate and the bottom of the scriber, and then turn the hand wheel to bring the scriber down until it just touches the shim. If you move the shim a little bit, you'll be able to tell when you've made good contact because you'll feel just a little bit of drag on the shim. This is a really sensitive way to get a good touch off. Okay, now zero out the digital readout, remove the shim, then bring the scriber down a distance equal to the thickness of the shim, in this case two thousandths, then re-zero the digital readout. Now, any vertical distance that we set with the height gauge will be from the surface plate, which is what the scriber was set to and which is also what our part is sitting on. We're going to lay out basically two features, both of which have to do with the protrusion on the right side of the part. The first is going to be the sides of the protrusion itself, so that we know where to remove the excess material later on. The sort of step dimension between the side of the protrusion and the side of the part is not directly given on the print, but it's an easy thing to calculate. The overall depth dimension is 1 inch 250 thousandths. The depth dimension on the protrusion is 375 thousandths. So if we subtract 375 from 1 inch 250, we get 875 thousandths. Now divide this in half, and we get the step dimension on either side of the protrusion. That number is 437 thousandths and 5 tenths. It's actually 7 sixteenths of an inch, but we're not going to take it all the way out to four decimal places. Let's round this up to the nearest thousandths of an inch, 438 thousandths, uh, just for convenience sake. So go ahead and raise the scriber on the height gauge to 438 thousandths. Then, using the corner of the scriber, mark out a line at that height at least halfway down the part. Now flip the part 180 degrees and do the same thing on the other side. Now we want to mark the center line of the part in that depth dimension because we want to find the center of the quarter 20 UNC 2B hole, which is also the center of the radius that's gonna go on the end of the protrusion. This dimension is also not directly given on the print, but it's an easy thing to calculate. All we have to do is take the one inch 250 thousandths overall depth dimension and divide it by two to find the halfway point. So that would be 625 thousandths. So go ahead and raise the scriber on the height gauge to 625, and then mark a line on the part. And it doesn't need to be as long this time, it just needs to be on the end of the protrusion in the general area where that hole is going to be. Okay, now we need to mark out a few width dimensions. The first is going to be the 1 inch 500 thousandths dimension, which is sort of where the rectangular region of the part ends and the protrusion begins. 
So raise the scriber on the height gauge to 1 inch 500 thousandths, and then mark out two lines on the part, either side of the protrusion. The last line that we need to mark out is going to be the other center line of the quarter 20 UNC 2B hole, which is in the width direction. So that's going to be 2 inches 810 thousandths. Go ahead and raise the scriber on the height gauge to 2 inches 810 thousandths, and then mark another little line. It doesn't need to be very long, just so that we have a nice crosshair to locate that hole. And this is what it should look like. Now we do have one more thing to do, which is to lay out the radius. So let's go back to the workbench and grab a prick punch. The prick punch has a sharp conical point on one side with an included angle of 60 degrees. We'll need to position the point of the prick punch right on the center of the hole where the two laid out center lines intersect. This can be hard to see, so if you need magnifiers, don't hesitate to use them. Now give it a gentle whack with a hammer, and we've got ourselves a nice little spot mark. Now we're going to grab a very old school tool called a divider, which is closely related to a drawing compass. It has two spring-loaded legs with very sharp points at the end of them, which can be adjusted in their distance. Turn the knurled knob to open the divider a little bit. Now, using the engraved lines on a steel ruler, set the distance between the points so that they are at exactly 3 16ths of an inch, which is the fractional equivalent of the 190 thousandths radius specced on the print. Stick one of the points into the spot mark that we just punched, and then very carefully trace a circle with the spot mark at the center. Now we've got a nice curve to follow when we're making the radius at the belt sander. You know, we don't use layout methods that much anymore in a modern machine shop, but gosh darn it, it's so useful for things like this. Okay, we've laid out the part, but let's actually forget about the laid out geometry for a moment. We'll come back to it at a later step in the process. Back on the milling machine, go ahead and drop the knee, and switch out the end mill and the collet for a drill chuck. Clean off the mill vise, and then install some shorty parallels, like these. I think these are a half inch. Now mount the part in the vise, with the laid out side against the movable jaw of the vise, and the end of the part, with the radius on it, down against the parallels. Load an edge finder into the drill chuck, and we're going to find the center of the part in both the front and back direction and the left and right direction. We've done this a few times before, and I've covered the button mashing sequence on the digital readout, so I don't feel the need to go over it again here. When all is said and done, the XY0 on the digital readout should be the center of this narrow surface. We're going to drill and tap the number 632 UNC 2B holes, but first we need to do some calculations to figure out the locations of the holes. We can see that all of the holes are located on the center line of the part in the height dimension. We can also see that they are all equally spaced from each other by 281 thousandths, and that the entire hole pattern is centered on the part in the depth dimension. But to be able to make the holes, we need to find the distance of each hole from that center line in the depth dimension, and that's not given on the print directly. But it can be calculated relatively easily. We know that the two center holes are equidistant from the center line, and that their spacing relative to each other is 281 thousandths. That means that each one will have a distance from the center line of half of that value, which will be 140 thousandths and 5 ten thousandths of an inch. For convenience sake, and because it's not really going to matter much, let's just call that 141 thousandths. The outside holes are also equidistant from center, and we know that their distance from the center line is going to be that 141 thousandths plus the distance between the holes, 281 thousandths, which comes out to 422 thousandths. So let's go ahead and move the table to the location of the first hole, which will be 422 thousandths in the positive direction on the digital readout. Now we'll install a center drill and spot that hole. And just to make sure that we did all of our setup and calculations correctly, I'm going to spot all of the holes. So I'll move to 141 thousandths 
in the positive direction on the DRO and spot another hole, then move to negative 141 thousandths and spot that hole, and finally move to negative 422 thousandths and spot the last hole. That hole pattern does look correct to me, so let's move on to the number 36 twist drill. Okay, hit the surface with a little WD-40, and then I'm going to drill down just a little bit, not going to full depth right now, not yet. Instead, I'm going to shut off the spindle and bring the quill down so that the corner on the drill, where the drill point meets the flutes of the drill, so it's sort of like where the full diameter of the drill begins, that lines up with the very, very tippy top of the hole at the top surface of the part. This is just done by eye, so I'm really going to get in there and uh, make sure that everything lines up nicely. Then I'm going to set this as the z-axis zero. All of the holes now are going to be drilled to a depth of 400 thousandths from this point. It's important to note that on a print, the depth of a drilled hole is always specified based on the full diameter of the drill, not the point. So any drilled hole is always going to be a little bit deeper than what's specified on the print by an amount equal to the depth of that drill point. Okay, I'm going to turn the spindle back on and then drill all the way down to my final depth of 400 thousandths, as I said before. Then I'm going to move the table to the next hole location at negative 141 thousandths and drill that hole to the same depth move the table to the next hole location at positive 141 thousandths and drill that hole to the same depth and then move the table to the position of the final hole which actually i guess was the first hole that we started with and drill that hole to the same depth now we can clean the chips off the part and remove the drill and install the half inch by 90 degree countersink we're just going to take a little peck with the countersink on the top of this hole. We don't want a big countersink here. We just want to open it up so that it's a little bit bigger than the major diameter of the threads, the number six threads. The major diameter of a number six thread is 138 thousandths. Right now, the countersink measures about 155 thousandths, just using the jaws of a dial caliper opened up so that they look like they're lining up with the uh, the top of the hole. And that's a good 17 thousandths over the major diameter, so that's plenty. Somewhere between 15 and 30 thousandths is good. Now, just to make sure that all of the countersinks are uniform between the different holes, and so I don't have to do this guess and check anymore, I'll bring the non-rotating countersink down with the quill so that it sits inside of the countersink that we just made. Then I'll zero out the z-axis on the DRO at that spot. Now I can just go to zero on the quill for all of the remaining holes. So move the table to the next hole, drop the quill to zero on the z-axis on the digital readout, pull the tool back up, move over to the next hole, drop the quill to zero on the DRO, pull the tool up, then move over to the last hole and drop the quill to zero and pull it back up. Now we can brush off the chips, remove the countersink tool, and drop the knee, because we're going to need to install that whole tapping assembly to tap these holes. So first we'll need the spring-loaded tap guide, that goes into the drill chuck. Then we'll need the number 632 tap, and that will go into the tap wrench. The tap goes into the hole, and then the spring-loaded plunger on the tap guide goes into the divot on the end of the tap wrench. A little WD-40 and then tap away. But be very, 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 very careful when you tap these holes. That means that since the hole is small, the tap itself is also very small and therefore delicate, and since we're going down to the bottom of a blind hole, we can easily over torque the tap, which will cause it to break. Every quarter to a half of a turn, back the wrench off to break the chips, and then keep going, and as soon as you feel even the slightest little bit of resistance, stop. So here, it feels like I've hit the bottom of the hole, but I'm just testing it a little bit to make sure that that's really the bottom of the hole and not just resistance to the cut. But no, that really is the bottom of the hole, so I'm going to back the tap out completely. 
Okay, moving to the next hole location now, I'm going to brush all of the chips out of the flutes of the tap, just so that we don't start with a tap that's already clogged with material. Hit it with a little WD-40, and then, cautiously, tap the hole. Folks, breaking a tap off in a hole is no fun. I mean, it's going to happen to every machinist at some point, but it's, it's still not a great time. Because there's no really easy way to get the tap out once it's broken. So most of the time, the most expedient thing is just to scrap the part and start over, which can be very, very frustrating. So it's a really good idea to take your time with this and really pay attention to the feedback that you're getting from the resistance of the tap. Okay, repeat for the third and fourth holes. Now let's crank the knee back up and switch out those shorty parallels for some taller ones. And now we'll mount the part in the vise with the laid out side facing up and the side that we just drilled and tapped on the left. We'll need the edge finder again and the first thing we'll do is find the center of the part in the y-axis direction. Now, unfortunately, I don't have access to the actual sides of the part to find center, but I can just as easily find center of the vice jaws themselves. So that means that I'm finding the center of two surfaces that are facing each other rather than two surfaces that are facing away from each other, but it doesn't matter. The process is exactly the same. Okay, and once I've zeroed out the y-axis to the center of the part, now I'm going to find the left side edge. Again, you've found edges before, so I don't really feel the need to show this again. But once we've zeroed out the x-axis on the left side of the part, we are going to do something a little bit different. We're going to set up a vice stop, which is this little device here. It's basically just a spring-loaded clamp, which attaches directly to the fixed jaw of the vice. Set it over the jaw, then slide it to bump up against the end of the part, then use an allen wrench or hex key to tighten it down. A work stop like this is a simple but surprisingly useful productivity tool. It allows us to easily and repeatably locate a part in a specific position. So I should be able to remove the part from the vise right now and put it back in, and it should be in exactly the same spot as it was before, or at least very, very close to it. This is going to end up being very useful for us, because we're going to need to flip the part a few times to machine various features, but all of those features are going to be located from the left side of the part. So as long as we don't move the stop, or change the zero on the x-axis on the digital readout. And as long as we make sure to bump the part up against the stop when we retighten it in the vise, then we should never need to refind that left side edge. And that is pretty powerful stuff. Not only when you need to flip the same part multiple times as we do here, but also if you're making multiples of a part. You can find the position for your features on the first part, but then you never need to find them again on all of the subsequent parts. Pretty cool stuff. Anyway, we can take the edge finder out now, and we're going to make three holes. Each one of these holes is different, with multiple features and varying sizes. So although this is not the most efficient way to do this, I'm going to make each one of these holes individually. So I'm going to complete all the features on one hole before moving on to the next one. I think this will help us keep everything straight in our heads. The first hole is going to be the one with the quarter 20 UNC 2B screw threads, and that's going to be located on the center of the part in the depth dimension and 2 inches 810 thousandths from the left side. So we'll move the table over to 2 inches 810 thousandths on the x-axis and keep the table at the y-axis zero. And even though we already spot marked this hole with the prick punch, we're going to do it again with a number 4 center drill. Then we'll use a number 7 twist drill to drill all the way through the part. We'll use the half inch by 90 degree countersink to countersink the hole to a diameter of about 280 thousandths, which is 30 thousandths over the major diameter of the quarter 20 threads. And then we'll use a quarter 20 tap and our standard tapping procedure to tap that hole all the way through. 
Okay, that's one hole in the bag. The next one is going to be the counterboard hole, which is located 2 inches, 380 thousandths from the left side. So go ahead and position the table at 2 inches, 380 thousandths on the x-axis. We'll use the number 4 center drill to spot the hole. And then we'll use a 3 16th of an inch hole to drill all the way through the part. For the next tool to make the counter bore, we're going to switch out the drill chuck in exchange for a collet. A 3 8 of an inch collet to be exact, which will hold the shank of a 5 16th of an inch end mill. Very gently, bring the quill down to touch the bottom of the end mill to the top of the part. Now zero the z-axis on the digital readout. Turn on the spindle and plunge to a depth of 130 thousandths. Okay, we're done with that hole and we're done with this tool, so remove it and the collet and reinstall the drill chuck. The third hole is going to be the 750 thousandths to 752 thousandths diameter hole, which is located 750 thousandths from the left side. The total size tolerance for the diameter of this hole is only two thousandths of an inch, which is pretty freaking tight, but we'll be able to hit that with very minimal trouble because we're going to drill the hole first, a little bit undersized, and then we're going to open it up to the final size using a reamer. Reamers produce much more accurate holes than drills in terms of their size, roundness, and surface quality. So, go ahead and position the table at 750 thousandths on the x-axis. Spot the hole with a number 4 center drill. Since this hole is going to be relatively large, the drill that we're going to use is also going to be relatively large. So whenever this happens, when we need to use a drill that's larger than, let's say, a half of an inch, we usually go in with a smaller pilot drill first. The pilot drill removes the material just at the very center of the hole, which will make it significantly easier to plunge the larger drill through the material. The center of a drill, called the web, is a non-cutting part of the drill. When you press a drill through the material, the web sort of just smushes material around, and this is the reason why it takes so much downward force to press that drill through. It's usually not that big of a deal on drills below a certain size, like a half of an inch. But on drills above a half inch, it can become kind of an issue. So that's why we typically go in with a pilot drill, so that we simply don't have to cut on the center of the bigger drill. In any case, the size of the pilot drill is sort of arbitrary, and I'm just going to grab the 3 16 of an inch drill because it was handy. Okay, I'm going to drill all the way through the part with the pilot drill. And then I'm going to remove the drill chuck, because the bigger drill is actually too big to fit in a standard drill chuck. This is the drill right here. It's a 47 64ths drill, which is a 64th of an inch below 3 quarters of an inch, or 750 thousandths, which is going to be the final size of this hole. Hopefully you can see that it has a tapered shank. It's a Morse taper, which is not the same kind of taper that we have on the spindle of the milling machine. So we'll need to use this adapter, which adapts a number 2 Morse taper, which is the size on the drill, to the R8 taper on the spindle of the milling machine. Clean off the tapers, align the tang on the drill, and then jam the two together to lock them. Now stick that whole thing up into the spindle and tighten the drawbar. Hit the surface with some WD-40, Turn on the spindle, and press that drill all the way through the part. Okay, now we're done with the drill, but we're going to have to use the same adapter for the reamer. So install a drift into the slot in the adapter and give it a smack with a hammer to pop the tapers loose. Now grab the 3 quarters of an inch reamer and install that into the adapter. And then again install that whole thing into the spindle and tighten the drawbar. Now you can turn on the spindle and press the reamer all the way through the hole. It's really only designed to shave off a very small amount of material from the outside of the hole. Okay, great! We're done with that hole and done with the reamer, so go ahead and remove it and put the drill chuck back in. Okay, we can remove the part now, and those three holes are looking pretty good, but they've got some burrs on a few edges. So you can install a countersink into the drill chuck turn the spindle on, and sort of bop the holes up against the countersink to deburr those edges. 
This method is not going to work for the larger hole, so we'll need to find some other way to deburr it. And this is as good a time as any to introduce you to this tool, which has a swivel deburring blade. You just put the edge against the jog in the blade, and then scrape around that edge, and voila! Here's a closer look at the action. You do have to be a little bit careful, because it's easy with this tool to re-scratch a finished surface. But it is very, very handy. Okay, let's clean off the vise and install some shorter parallels. Now we want to mount the part in the vise so that the laid out side is against the movable jaw on the vise, so facing toward us, and the left side of the part that has the 632 tapped holes in it is still up against that uh, vise stop. The parallels that you select should allow the part to sit about halfway above the tops of the vise jaws. The next hole we're going to make is this super complicated one shown in the front view of the drawing. You can kind of think of it as a combination of a threaded hole and a counterboard hole. It's located on the center of the part in the height dimension and 1 inch 270 thousandths from the left side. So go ahead and install an edge finder in the drill chuck. We don't need to find the left side of the part because that is up against the vice stop, but we do need to find the center of the part in the y-axis. So go ahead and do that now. Move the table so that the x-axis is at 1 inch 270 thousandths, and then load up a center drill and spot the hole. Then load up a number 36 twist drill and just drill a little ways into the part. We're going to use the same trick that we did before, where we line up the end of the drill point and the beginning of the full diameter of the drill with the top of the hole, then zero out the z-axis on the DRO. Now we'll drill to a total depth of 810 thousandths. And this is a pretty deep hole for such a small drill, so make sure that you're doing a little pecking action and periodically pull the drill out of the hole to clear the chips. Okay, now we're going to go in with a slightly bigger drill, a number 25 drill, and we're going to use the same trick to touch off the bottom of the drill and zero out the z-axis on the digital readout. Once you've done that, go ahead and drill to a depth of, well, at least 370 thousandths. Actually, we want to go just a little bit more because we want to make sure that after we cut the slit through the center of this hole, that the diameter we're creating with this drill goes all the way through into the slit. So, to be on the safe side, let's drill to a depth of 400 thousandths. That would be 30 thousandths over what it says on the print. Okay, now load up the counterbore tool for the number 6 screw. This tool looks like some kind of a combination between a reamer and an end mill. And you may even be wondering to yourself, why are we not using an end mill to make this counterbore like we did for the other counterbore? The answer to that is that this is the more appropriate tool to use to make a counterbore. An end mill does not actually have a flat bottom, so when you plunge it into a hole to create a counterbore, the bottom of the counterbore has a sort of conical tapered surface. And that is not desirable when you're using the counterbore for an actual screw, which is what we're going to be doing here. A counterbore tool, on the other hand, does have a flat bottom, so it will produce a counterbore with a flat bottom. Perhaps you've also noticed that it has a cylindrical tip on it, called a pilot, which is for supporting and locating the tool when making the counterbore. The diameter of the pilot is just slightly smaller than the diameter of the hole that we drilled. Anyway, with the spindle off, gently bring the quill down so that the bottom of the counterbore touches the top of the part. Now zero out the z-axis on the digital readout, turn on the spindle, and plunge to a depth of 140 thousandths. Okay, last thing to do on this hole is tap the number 632 threads. So we're going to do this the same way that we did those four holes earlier. Remember that this is also a blind hole, so exercise extreme caution when tapping this hole. All right, looks like we made it through unscathed, so we can take out the tapping assembly, and we can take out the part. At long last, all of the holes on this part are done, and there were quite a few of them. This would be a very good place to stop and have a snack before we move on to finish this part. Don't worry, I'll still be here when you get back. All right, welcome back. 
The next thing we're going to do on this part is machine the protrusion on the right side. And that means that we have quite a bit of excess material to remove on either side of the protrusion. And although we could remove this material with a milling cutter on the milling machine, it's much more efficient to do it on a bandsaw. On a bandsaw, only the kerf or the thickness of the bandsaw blade itself is doing any cutting. All the other material that's removed doesn't actually get cut. It just gets separated. And for this reason, the bandsaw is a very efficient way to remove large amounts of material, although you may not have thought of it that way. For these cuts, we're going to refer back to the layout lines that we produced toward the beginning of this project. We're going to set up the rail on the table of the bandsaw so that the bandsaw blade is just a little bit to the side of the layout line. Just be mindful that when you tighten the clamp on the rail, it can kind of move a little bit, so make sure that you're in the right position when it's clamped. This right here is approximately what it should look like. We're giving ourselves about a sixteenth of an inch between the layout line and the side of the bandsaw blade. Okay, make sure that your part is well away from the bandsaw blade, then put the bandsaw into high gear, and start the motor. Now you can rotate the handle on the variable speed drive and dial in about 2500 surface feet per minute, which is appropriate for aluminum. We'll use this stick of waxy lubricant to lubricate the blade. Just kind of jam it in there and uh, let the bandsaw come around like one full rotation so that all of the teeth can get coated. For safety's sake, so that we keep our fleshy little fingers away from the bandsaw blade, we'll use these two pieces of plastic to push on the part. One piece goes behind the part to push it into the bandsaw blade, and the other piece goes on the side to push it against the rail so that the cut is nice and straight and follows our layout line. Alright, go ahead and push the part into the bandsaw blade, nice and smooth and consistent, and when it gets close to that other layout line that's perpendicular to the one that we're following, stop. Shut off the bandsaw and pull the part out. Now readjust the rail so that the bandsaw blade is on the other side of the part, following the other layout line. Again, you want to stay about a sixteenth of an inch away from the layout line. Turn on the bandsaw, push the part through. When you get close to that other line that's perpendicular to the one that you're following, stop. Turn off the bandsaw, pull out the part, and we can clean all the chips off. Okay, now set up the rail so that the bandsaw is going to be following one of the perpendicular lines. Turn on the bandsaw, start pushing your part in, and as soon as this cut meets the other cut, that little rectangle of excess material is going to pop out and separate. That's when you want to stop. Make sure that you don't keep pushing past this point, because then you're going to score the surface, and you may score it so deeply that it won't clean up when we mill the surface. Anyway, flip the part over 180 degrees so that the layout lines are facing down now, and cut the other side out. So this is what it should look like. We've roughed out all of that excess material, we've got these two little rectangular slivers left over, but all of those bandsaw cut lines do not touch the layout lines. We still have a little material there to remove. And that we're going to do on the milling machine. So go ahead and deburr the edges on all of the bandsaw cut surfaces. Make sure that the part and the mill vise are nice and clean, then mount the part in the vise the same way that we had it before. Now remove the drill chuck and reinstall the half-inch end mill and the half-inch collet that we were using at the beginning of this project. Bring the quill down gently to touch the bottom of the end mill with the top of the part. Zero out the z-axis on the digital readout. Lift the quill up a little bit so that we don't drag the end mill across that surface, then move over and bring the end mill back down so it's about halfway down that bandsaw cut surface. Now turn on the spindle and do a light touch off on that surface. Zero the x-axis now, then move the part off of the cutter, dial in a cleanup cut of maybe ten thousandths on the x-axis, and then I'm going to go ahead and zero this out again, and then take a little cleanup cut on that surface. Now measure the length that you just cut with a dial caliper, and this looks like 1 inch 534 thousandths. Then set the x-axis on the digital readout to that size. Okay, now move your part so that the cutting tool is on the far right side. Bring the quill down to position the z-axis at 438 thousandths. 
Okay, we're ready to take this cut. Go ahead and turn on the spindle, and then we're going to feed the milling cutter all the way down that protrusion, just straight down the center. Now stop when you get close to that vertical surface and feed the part away from the tool. Now move the table to 1 inch 500 thousandths on the x-axis, and then feed across that vertical surface. That should be it for the step on that side of the protrusion. Let's go ahead and clean all the chips off and then pull out the part. Those milled surfaces are looking pretty good, but there are some burrs on the edges. So go ahead and file those edges, then clean off the mill vise, flip the part 180 degrees so that the layout lines are against the fixed jaw on the vise now, and then remount the part in the vise. Now we're going to do exactly to this side what we did to the other side. And since we already set the position of our end mill, we're not going to have to do any of that again. So all we have to do is take a cut down the center of the protrusion, stop when we get close to that vertical surface, come off, move into 1 inch 500, and then take a cut across the vertical surface to establish our length. Okay, brush off those chips, remove the part, and this is looking really good. This is looking really close to being done. Make sure to file off all those edges, clean the mill vise, and then put the part back in in that sort of first orientation with the layout lines against the movable jaw, so kind of facing towards us. Now take out the end mill and pop in the slitting saw. It should fit in the same collet. A slitting saw is basically a circular saw blade attached to a cylindrical shank. And we'll be using this tool to make the slit that goes through the part into that big hole. Position the part so that the slitting saw is over top of the protrusion. Then bring the quill down and stick a two thousandths of an inch shim or feeler gauge in between the slitting saw and the top of the protrusion. Continue bringing the quill down just until you feel a little bit of a tug on the shim. We'll want to lock the quill and set the zero on the z-axis right here. When we cut the slit, the bottom surface of the slitting saw should be very close to, but not touching, the top surface of the protrusion. Position the part so that the tool is at the beginning of the cut, turn the spindle on, and then you're just going to feed all the way through. Make sure that you don't have any collisions anywhere. This is a little bit of a tight fit. It would have been nicer if the slitting saw had a slightly larger diameter than this. If I can find some a little bigger, I'll have you use those. All right, all done. That was a pretty easy feature to make, right? So go ahead and clean off all the chips, and you may have to lift the quill to get access to all of them, and then remove the part. And yeah, that slit looks uh, fantastic. The very last step on this part, which had many, many steps, is to make the radius on the end of the protrusion. For this, we'll use the belt sander, so go ahead and turn it on. Set the part down on the work rest with the layout lines facing up, we're going to need to see those, and just kind of work the part around on the sanding belt. You're trying to remove material from those two corners using a kind of swiveling action so that the surface that you're generating is following the circular lines that you laid out earlier. Here you can see what I mean, but you can also see that I'm not quite down to my layout lines yet, so I need to go a little bit more. And that looks pretty good. However, the belt sander did leave kind of a rough finish, so let's smooth that out. Turn off the belt sander and turn on the buffer polisher. We'll be using the Scotch-Brite surface conditioning wheel. It has a finer grit abrasive, which is held in a softer matrix, almost like a cloth. Anyway, we'll just follow the radius on the wheel to smooth out that surface. And that looks pretty good. Did not take very much time at all. Maybe we can do the edges a little bit? Yeah, that looks okay. All right, turn off the buffer polisher, head back to the workbench, and use a shop towel and some acetone to remove all of the layout fluid, because we don't need it anymore. Why? Because this part is done! Okay, it's not completely done. The part still needs to get bead blasted, and the bottom surface needs to get lapped, and the PTFE tape needs to be applied. But all the machining operations are done, and that was a lot of work. If you successfully completed this part, you should be downright proud of yourself. Go out for dinner and say yes to dessert. You deserve it. <laughs> anyway, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.